All right, we are uh, live and ready to roll. Thank you everyone for joining us. We're gonna allow folks to um, join us and come on into our educational webinar today. Um, thank you for, for joining us. My name is Anissa Aven, and we're gonna get started here in just a moment. Hello, Neil, thank you for being with us. Hello. Uh, this is our webinar today um, called Communicate, how to talk effectively about all the things you think you can't talk about at all. And I think this is a, a very timely and important topic. It is um, part of our Leading in a Crisis Virtual Summit, Actionable Business and HR Strategies for Navigating Crisis and Change. And we wanna make sure that you get the most out of your time with us today. So if you're joining us and you have a question or um, even a contrarian opinion, we wanna hear from you. We wanna make this useful. So don't hesitate to let us know how we can do that. Um, send us a chat message and, and we'll make sure we monitor that. I want to say thank you to our sponsors, the Whitmarsh Consulting Group. Um, they're incredible team of multi-channel marketing specialists and HR IT consulting specialists have really supported us in our mission to provide webinars of value to help our friends and peers and clients and others navigate this crazy time of chaos. So thank you, David and your team. I want to say thank you to Insperity, HR that makes a difference, who is also our sponsor. Insperity didn't hesitate. I reached out and said, would you guys be willing to be a sponsor for our webinar that, oh, by the way, we're going to launch tomorrow. I'm so proud of my team. They put together this uh, event and it's every Wednesday and Thursday in April and May uh, in a matter of days. This kind of thing typically takes about 90 days to pull off. They pull it off in a matter of less than a week. And so when I reached out to Insperity, they didn't hesitate either. Like Neil, they said, we're in, sign me up. How can I serve? And um, then I went back and, and took a chance that I could get them to do something more. And I said, well, what would you be willing to do free for our folks who need assistance? Because right now we all need assistance. And they said, they thought about it and said, well, how about a free HR financial analysis report and a debrief? And I, I asked them, well, what is that? Is that like, like a form and you send them back this PDF telling them how great you are? You know, kind of what is that? And they said, no, 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 this will take us, depending on the size of the company and the complexity of the budget, it'll take us anywhere from three to 10 hours to put this together. And I hesitated because I said, well, you know, a lot of our clients aren't going to be a good fit for you, right? And you're willing to, to spend that kind of time? And they said, yeah, this is, this is, we're all throwing in right now, right? And so don't hesitate to reach out to them. We know that your 2020 budget, maybe even your 2021 budget has been crumpled up and put in the waste bin. Um, if they may be of service and this conversation will help you gain some clarity on where you are and where you need to be in HR and your trajectory, this could be an incredible value. You can learn more and take advantage of that offer at turnkeycoachingsolutions.net forward slash HR report. I also want to say um, thank you to our team of strategists who've put together a data-driven crisis strategy approach to revamping your departmental or your organizational uh, corporate strategy. We know that um, many of us have had to lay off or furlough workers. Um, we've had some clients that have shuttered their door and are now trying to figure out how to even repurpose and, and re-engineer their um, manufacturing lines for a whole new line of business. And um, it's about speed. And if we can support you in getting back to, to business and getting your team aligned on the new strategy and what we have to do different um, from here and beyond, it would be our privilege. It's not free. It's the next best thing. It is name your own price. I've gathered a team of folks who are willing to do this work, who are experts, um, who have spent many years studying strategy. So uh, it would be our privilege. Call me at 281-469-4244 to learn more about that. 
As I mentioned, my name is Anissa Avon. I am the CEO and founder of Turnkey Coaching and Development Solutions. We provide enterprise learning and development um, solutions for organizations of all size, sizes, including outplacement services and um, virtual training, coaching, strategy, you name it. But what I'm most proud about of right now is that we have 40 experts and counting for every uh, Wednesday and Thursday in April and May. Uh, go back to the site and check out uh, new speakers that we're adding all the time. HTTPS leading in crisis dot turnkey coaching solutions dot com. Um, Neil, um, I'm so thrilled that you were so gracious and willing to join us. Um, Neil is the founder of Collaborant. He's a former president of People Smart Solutions, where he started as a single consultant and grew that organization to over $3 million worth of consulting and training organization. He um, started out knowing evidently this was going to be your passion because he got an MBA in organizational behavior as well as his BBA from Brigham Young University. Um, so tell us a little bit about you, Neil, and what we're going to learn today. So what we're going to learn today is uh, one of my favorite topics. We are, let me jump here to my presentation. I've got some slides here. Oh, good. That's going to help us out and some videos, some great videos. Okay. I find all the time, when people find out what I do, it's kind of like if people find out that you're a doctor, they start saying, I've got this weird thing in my elbow. When people find out that I teach communication skills, the number one thing I get asked is not how can I listen better, it's I've got a tough thing I, I don't know how to talk about. And a lot of times I'll ask them, how long has this thing been going on? And they'll say, oh, years, <laughs> years. And, and I realize we're surrounded by things we think we can't talk about and it compromises our relationships and our results. And we can talk about them and we can talk about them effectively. Things that we thought we could never, never bring up, we can bring up quite easily and, and uh, with a lot of success. So I want to introduce an idea. I don't know if you guys can see this. This is a bottle of Coca-Cola. Okay. So uh, particularly, we always have tough things to talk about at work and at home, but with the pandemic, we have more and maybe there's a little more importance. So I have five kids at home at present, back from college or still at home. Four of them need to use the computer every day to do online school. You can imagine that creates some conflict. Um, so people get annoyed. But my wife hates contention. So she's taught our kids, like, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. So somebody jumped on the computer when I get up to go use the bathroom and they say, well, but you left it. You weren't using it. But I was using it. And I can, well, you know, we weren't. And so what we find is people get agitated. Okay. So if I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit agitated, but I don't say anything because I want to keep the peace, but I am agitated. Right. And then it happens again and I'm more agitated. And this goes on and on and we get more and more agitated. And then Anissa, would you open don't us? Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> we explode. Um, sometimes we explode by actually yelling more often. We explode with our eyes, with our tone of voice. Um, but we, we talk when we're annoyed and frustrated because we've been pushed to the point where we can't keep it inside anymore. That's the worst possible time that we can talk and other people get defensive, reinforces the idea that we can't talk. So we're cooped up at home. That creates a lot of tough things to talk about, uh, about leaving out messes and who gets time on the computer and who's being loud and who needs privacy. But we've got tough things to talk about at work too. Um, I want you to imagine maybe in a finance department, you've got some people that are all very comp or very capable, except one person who doesn't pull their own weight. They make a lot of mistakes. They don't do as much work as everybody else, but they're nice. They've been around for a long time. They're friendly. So we've let that slide for years or months or whatever it looks like. Only now our budget's being cut. Only now we've got to be more productive. And some of those issues, performance issues or other issues that maybe we could let slide before, we can't let them slide anymore. So we've got to step up and figure out how to talk about those things effectively. I'm going to give you three powerful skills real quick. The first one's going to take about five to eight minutes. The second one will take about 15 to 20. And the last one will take about 10. Skill number one, I'm going to tell you a story about a miter saw. As you listen to this story, I want you to um, ponder a couple of questions. One, is my wife happy? And if the answer to that question is no, I want you to think about what's really bugging her. 
And all of you listening, if you would type in um, your answers in the chat window, what's really bugging her? If, if I'm telling the story and you think, ooh, that would really bug me, type it in the chat window. Okay, here's the story. I love power tools. I don't need power tools. I just want to own them. It's, it's like a, I should rent them, but I want to own them. And so I want you to imagine that I'm at Home Depot and there it is my coveted DeWalt 12 inch compound miter saw with laser cut. And it's on clearance. It's not $4.99, it's half price, it's $2.49. So I snatch that puppy up and I'm driving home, I'm feeling happy. And all of a sudden I think, I don't know if my wife will appreciate this addition to my collection. <laughs> I get this idea, camouflage. So I get it out of the box, I put it on the shelf and it's looking way too shiny. So I put some old paint cans on it, find some dusty old rags and I'm shaking them to get all the dust to come off and kind of doing my camouflage job. And the, wife, and the, the door swings open, the garage door swings open from the house. Out walks my wife with a bag of garbage. She drops it in the can there and she looks at me and she says, what is that thing? <laughs> Big smile, it's a miter saw, sweetie. How much did it cost? It was half price. She persists, how much is half price? It was only $249, but it's got the 12 inch blade and it's got laser cut. So we get in a little argument and she wants me to take it back, I wanna keep it. So we argue for a minute and I say, fine, you win, I'll take this stupid thing back. And she says, good. Closes the door and goes in the house. Is she happy? No. No. She is not happy, not one bit. So I want to know why isn't she happy? She got what she wanted. She wanted me to take the saw back. She won the argument. Um, so why isn't she happy? What's really bugging her? What kind of things are you seeing on the chat window there? Well, we're seeing things like um, there's bigger problems here. Um, you know how I feel about your t power tools in the first place and yet here you are. And then did I just catch you hiding your power saw? <laughs> 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 Jessica says not part of the decision making process. Yes, not part. Okay, exactly. So I kind of took a guess because I've done this a few times. Uh, this is an activity I pull from a larger workshop and I've, I've done it literally hundreds if not thousands of times. So I kind of know what the answers would be. So we have a few issues in play here. One is the saw itself. Do we need a miter saw, a really awesome miter saw for $249, which is steal of a deal. But there's deeper issues. There's bigger issues. I didn't ask first. This wasn't a joint decision. I didn't get permission. I didn't even inform. I've done this before. Um, today it's a miter saw. Last month it was a router. The month before that it was a jigsaw, right? And I'm being sneaky. How can you trust your husband when he's being sneaky? It's like, so you feel comfortable hiding this from me. Where does that line stop? You know, what don't you feel comfortable hiding from me? So we've got these, these deeper issues. Now, you'll notice there's an image of a dandelion. I want everybody to ponder, what is the analogy between this list of issues and a dandelion? If you want, you can type things in the chat window. Um, and Anissa, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. Yeah, so um, Paige wrote roots, which is, you know, what's beneath the surface here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also thinking, you know, our, our relationship is fragile. And um, it may be beautiful, but it's also fragile and you got to pay attention. Yes, it is fragile and um, things, negative things that get into your relationship, they can spread, right? Dandelions can take over a lawn really quickly. So right That's now- like Kelly wrote, Kelly wrote, it can spread if not taken care of. If you, and how, what's the way to take care of it? you gotta to get to the root. That was one of the first comments, right? So we have a surface issue that if at first glance, this was a conversation about a saw. This was not about a saw. If it was about a saw, my wife would be thrilled, but it was never about the saw. There's deeper issues at play here about trust and respect and fairness and uh, consistency. And those issues are unaddressed. Because those issues are unaddressed, the problem is not only solved um, or not resolved, it's going to spread. So now we're upset with each other about a miter saw, but we're gonna be upset about other things and it's gonna taint our relationship and it's gonna make it harder tonight to talk about a budgeting issue because there's still that, that acrimony in the air. And so um, it is going to spread and the only way to deal with it is to get to the root. Now, um, let me introduce, I, I, I wanted to introduce this with a fun family example because it's very relatable, but this is certainly by no means limited to home. Let me give you two quick work examples. 
Have you ever seen two people arguing about something that seemed petty? Maybe they're arguing about how to do a table in a presentation to, to executives. Mm -hmm. And one person wants the table this way and somebody else wants the table that way. The table is the surface issue. There's deeper issues at play. Why do you always have to be right? Yeah. Why can't you, you know, I put this table together. Why can't you just look at it and say, thanks, let's roll with it. Why do you have to nitpick and tweak and, and change everything that I ever do? Why isn't ever good enough for you? That's the deeper underlying issue that they're not talking about. Or maybe you see in a meeting, you've got people um, butting heads over a, a budget issue for a new project. But what's really driving the, the issue is not the budget. That's the surface level that you can see. The deeper level issue is why wasn't I brought into this project in the early planning stages? I'm supposed to be a member of this team, but I'm always brought in after the plan's already gone through its initial formative stages. Um, I'm kind of an afterthought, like, oh, I guess we need to get funding for this. Let's bring in Neil and, and we'll just get him to rubber stamp what we want to do. That's the real issue is why am I not seen as an equal player on this team? The problem is if we watch 100 people go through these scenarios, 99% of them talk about the miter saw or the yeah. table or the budget. Only one out of 100 will talk about those deeper root issues. But if you wanna get results, if you wanna have a satisfying, productive conversation, you've gotta go deep to the root. So skill number one, you gotta to get to that root issue. When you're talking about tough topics, don't get caught up on surface issues, address root causes. Uh, skill number one, let's go on to skill number two. Um, we're going to watch a meeting, and this is going to introduce our second skill. As you watch this meeting, I want you to think about who is, who's more effective, who's more persuasive, who seems more reasonable. Um, if somebody makes a comment, you think, oh, wow, that really had an impact on me. Um, put that in your chat. Uh, you know, just type it in the chat window, or if somebody says something like, oh, that was totally turned me off, you know, I'd be shut down, then enter that in as well. So here we go. Let's watch the video and enter as we go along. For two months, we have been looking at whether or not we should outsource our call center. I know some of you don't want to hear it, but the best option says that we should service our calls here. You are in denial. If you want to make money, you have to outsource. It's, it's as clear as a nose on your face. Okay, outsourcing certainly saves money on labor. I don't think anyone would contest that. My concern is that we lose opportunities for upselling. Here's an example. Just last week, I called my bank because I wanted some info on different types of accounts. My call was outsourced, and the person I talked to couldn't answer any of my questions. He could only give me basic information on stuff that I could find online myself. He put me on hold so he could look things up. I didn't open a new account, and I also lost respect for the company. I can't imagine any outsourced rep will know as much or care as much as our current team. That might be true sometimes, but when we looked at our call volume from last year, we found that 90% of our calls were for routine, simple issues. I mean, things like changing a password. I think that for those types of calls, a low cost option is best. When somebody calls and needs a new password, they're not really looking to have an upsell conversation. It's more that they just want somebody to verify their identity and send them a new password. I think we're missing the big picture here. If we dilute our service advantage, we are dead in the water. I say we service our calls here. <laughs> Is service advantage your way of saying you don't like to work with foreigners? Hey, I don't have an issue with foreigners. It just seems a little uh, disloyal to our current call center team, that's all. I think I can add some detail. We've been successful because we're a smaller organization with a really strong culture of working together to help our customers succeed. Our service levels have been in the top 5% of the industry. If we outsource, do we kill that sense of working together and dilute our service advantage? Okay, there we have it. That is the video. Uh, so four players there. Just so everybody knows, we, we don't pigeonhole our actors. We, um, we randomly assign roles and you'll get to see those who are behaving badly. You'll get to, to see them behave uh, well in uh, some future videos. But um, I would like to know just your thoughts, Anissa, or anything you're seeing on the chat. Um, what did people find effective? What worked? What didn't work from that video? Well, if, if I can answer from what didn't work, there was some clear tension 
um, between certain members of the group, and and it was obvious their tone, their stance, their uh, the way that they looked at one another, um, and and that's a below the surface issue um, from what you're sharing with us that probably needs to be addressed. Yes, there are some deep, definitely some um, deep issues there, uh, some root issues that go on with some of them. You know, it's interesting too, the, the two, and you don't know the names, but um, Yolanda and Ben are the two that are behaving poorly. They're the ones that are just pushing for what they want and they're, they're, it's as clear as your nose on the face or we're dead in the water. Um, it's interesting, if you look at what's driving their behavior, they both want so badly to convince others to agree with them. Nothing is quite so unconvincing or so off-putting as somebody who wants to make you believe what they say is true. Um, the harder we push, the more we want to convince, the more we want to have our opinion win the day, the less persuasive we become. Because the things we do become very off-putting. We tend to kind of go to our primitive brain and we push and we use um, overstatements and, and become a little bit argumentative, a little bit dismissive. And that immediately ruins our credibility and people put up walls and kind of shut us out. But if you look at the other two, Elijah and Tiffany, um, I don't know if there's any comments about what there they are. Do. Yeah, that's uh, almost exactly yeah, uh, yeah. what I wanted to read. So um, uh, one of our uh, participants said the second woman looks at the situation internally self and gives examples. Um, then Kelly wrote, I thought the people who cited facts were more credible. Yes. Um, Sheila wrote, I also appreciated the percentage use in the third person. Mm -hmm. uh, and likewise, someone else said the third person seems to be neutral and open. And then Paige wrote, uh, fourth offers data to back up his stance in contrast to, his, to, to her personal use. So I think that's pretty um, clear about where you're headed here. Yeah. So what we find, let me uh, advance, there's a lot of reasons we can give people to, to agree with what we think. Um, we're going to rate those reasons. So if you look at that blue box, there's data research and facts. That is the gold standard. If you can say over 90% of our calls are for simple routine issues, that has huge credibility. Data research and facts are the gold standard. A close second is personal experience. What personal experience has that data research and facts don't is it's very relatable. So when Tiffany's talking about being put on hold, you could throw that out and say that's one data point. It's not credible. We'd need to have a, a more formal study. So it doesn't have the credibility of the data, but boy, is it relatable. Um, I don't know about you, but I was thinking like, yep, I, I've been there before. I've, I've told people on the phone things about their program or their company that I found on the, their website that they themselves didn't know. It's like, let me teach you about what your company does and doesn't do. <laughs> so personal experiences are very relatable. What we find is people that are particularly good at this stuff blend those top two. They, they, they're really good at blending data research and facts to get credibility with personal experience, which makes it relatable. The other thing that we've found is oftentimes there is no data. So um, we're talking to somebody who's domineering in meetings and we want to give them some feedback. It's hard to find facts for that, right? Um, you know, the American Association of Management did a study and found out that you're the worst manager on the planet. You know, it's like, there's no data for that. It's just my personal experience. All I can share is what I've seen. Does it mean that some of those ones on the bottom, does it mean I never share feelings or opinions or, or principles? No, those are very powerful in the right setting. But for the kind of situations we're talking about, giving tough feedback, performance coaching, working through um, decisions at work, we're gonna be in those top two if we wanna be effective. Um, the last question there is how many should we share? We find that as we teach people to find good data and research and facts and to share personal experiences, they get so excited and they feel like almost like they're an attorney preparing for a case. And they're like, yeah, I've got five um, data points or research points and I've got these three personal experiences and I'm ready. You're going to trip and fall flat on your face. Um, it's going to come across like um, Ben and Yolanda did, like you're trying to convince people, maybe not by being forceful and using pushy language, but by overwhelming data. It works best to share one or two things and then turn the time back over them. One of the things that Tiffany and Ben or and Elijah both did very well is they didn't push. They said, well, I've seen this. What have others seen? Or this is one way of looking at it, but, but you know, um, I'm sure others have a different perspective. The more open you are, the more open others are. They tend to mirror what you do in that regard. So we wanna share one or two. You can always share more later, but uh, don't overwhelm them up front. So let's introduce a principle here. 
the way our brains work, we notice things and then we form conclusions based on the things that we notice. So I see and hear, I'm in a meeting, I see you do certain things, I hear you say certain things, the conclusion I draw is that you're domineering, right? So I've noticed and then I think. We go through things in that order. I always notice things first and then that helps me formulate thoughts, what I think. But when we share feedback, or when we share opinions, we do it backwards. We share just what we think, our conclusion, not what we noticed. Our brain works better um, going from things we notice to things we think, so do other people's brains. So we're gonna get really good at sharing what we've noticed first. Hey, I saw the data for this, or I, I read last month's analysis and I noticed that the, the, the numbers are up 12%, or hey, I saw in, in um, that coaching uh, session that you said this, and after you said this, the other person broke eye contact and kind of just looked at their notes for the rest of the time. If we can share what we see or hear first, the things we notice, and then our conclusions, the thing we think, it's gonna be very powerful. So we're gonna do a little activity um, called blind spots. I want you to imagine that you know somebody that is arrogant. It's a pretty universal, I think most of us uh, know somebody like that. So think of somebody that you know that's arrogant, and I want you to type in the chat window, what do you see them do or hear them say? These are things we noticed right? What do we see them do or hear them say that make us think they're arrogant? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, what's go ahead. Come, I just, just what, what are you seeing in the chat or what comes to your mind? Yeah. So um, uh, Paige wrote, he's uh, very judgmental and critical of others. Um, Beth writes, uh, talk in a, a condescending fashion. Um, Sheila writes, I hear them sharing their opinion, but in a way where they want you to also take their opinion. Uh, in, in my experience, there's also a level of inflexibility or superiority at times. Okay, perfect. What I'm going to do now is incredible. Um, in about 30 seconds, you will all hate me and think like, oh, this guy is a jerk. Um, I'm okay with that. I'm totally it's a good trick. It's a trick. Um, so you're all going to hate me in about 30 seconds. And then in about a minute, you're going to think that guy's brilliant. He has just changed my world. So stick with me for the, uh, through the, the jerk part. Every one of you failed this miserably because this is our blind spot. All the things, when I asked you to share things you noticed, every single thing that was shared was something that people think. Condes I took a guess at what would come up. So condescending, I actually got one right word for word, talks down to people, um, dominates, other things that were shared was judgmental, inflexible, they share what they want in a way that makes, tries to convince you. All of those are our conclusions. None of those are what they actually did. And you're thinking, no, I was there, I saw it. The guy was condescending. I, I was there with my own eyes, I heard with my ears. Here's where it gets tricky. If you're on the receiving end of this, if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, during that meeting, you were condescending and judgmental. They have no clue what you're talking about. And a lot of us have been on the receiving end of that where somebody gave us some feedback and we had no idea what they were talking about. If we're gonna crack this open, if we're gonna learn how to talk about tough things, we've gotta become a video recorder. Imagine instead that you could just go and say, I want you to watch this video. Notice yourself between the two and a half and three minute mark. Just watch, listen to what you say, look at your face and notice what you do. That is our job is to become the human video recorder. So what we wanna do is get really good at being very, very specific. So instead of saying you were condescending, we would say, when Anissa was talking, you sighed audibly twice and you rolled your eyes. Mm. It came across as condescending to me. Or instead of saying dominates the conversation, you could say like three times as you were making your presentation, you mentioned your conversations with the CEO. To me, that seemed to be trying to dominate or assert your opinion over other people's opinions because you have that connection and we don't. Or instead of saying like, you know, you talk down to people or uh, you could say like, you looked at your phone while other people were talking. Um, you seem very detached. Even to say you seem very detached, that's still what you think, right? To say you were looking at your phone while Paige was talking, that, that gets more specific. Now, the reason this is brilliant is um, it's incredibly helpful for the other person. It doesn't come across as, an un, as a biased attack. It comes across as helpful coaching. Um, it comes across as very non-judgmental and it helps them see specifically what they were doing. So one of the ones I really liked because it got close to being more, you noticed, is they're sharing things, but in a way that makes you want, that, that is trying to convince you. If you could say like, 
hey, Doug, when you were talking, you used phrases like, it's obvious, everybody knows, or the only reasonable option is. And when other somebody else started to ask a question, you interrupted them and said, let me explain this again. It seemed like you thought your opinion was the only right one and you were, into, you were trying to convince us rather than, than to share. After you shared those specific details, you can totally have that conversation. And it comes across as very helpful and caring rather than judgmental. Um, so this, this is huge. If you can master this, it's amazing the things that you can talk about that you think are taboo or that you can't bring up. We have this saying that says, if you can describe it, you can share it. Wow. You know, this is, um, so folks, if, when you're on the call with us, um, don't hesitate to share with us what you're taking away from it. I think that that always helps me um, really begin to use it and apply it long after our time together. And um, so what you're saying is the first order of business is to acknowledge what you're observing, just what did I notice? And then um, the way that you described it was, then you can share my perception about that is, is that accurate? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and then we're, we become the kind of person that provides really helpful non-judgmental feedback, which is what people want, right? Um, and it's, it's great. And from an HR perspective, I know I work with a lot of people in HR and one of their least favorite things is when a manager comes and says, I've got to get rid of this person. You know, we've got to get rid of them. And they're like, well, why? And they're like, because they're, they're condescending or they're irresponsible. And it's like, well, give me some specifics. And the, the manager can't give any specifics. And it's like, we can't coach. We can't manage performance. We can't hold people accountable. We can't correct. We can't improve. We can't even show lack of progress on an improvement plan if we can't get specific. Um, and if you never get specific, then when they file a wrongful termination suit, um, it's, it's just opinions, um, which is really hard to work with. So, Very good. Very good. Denise shared, I like to think about the I notice part as behavior you can actually see on a video recording. That was really a good takeaway. Thank you, Neil. Yes. Yeah, it's something you could see on the recording. Or another way I like to think of it is if you were an actor and somebody came up to you and said, we're going to shoot a video and I want you to do the following. And they said, I want you to be inflexible. And you'd be like, I, I don't know what to do. How do I act out inflexible? Um, but if somebody came up to you and said, I want you to fold your arms, lean back, shake your head and say, we wouldn't even consider an option like that. Um, it's like, I can act that out. I can do that, right? If you can describe it so that an actor could, could um, do, um, do what you're asking, then, then you know you've got it right. So Excellent. Um, yep, it's very behaviorally specific. Okay, now, this is one of my favorite learning activities just because it's fun and it, uh, we're gonna show you two videos. One is better and one is worse. And um, I want you and everyone else to think about what makes the better one better and the worse one worse. I won't tell you which one is worse and which one is better. It's pretty obvious, but you'll decide. And then in the chat um, function, just kind of enter in like, this made the worst one worse, or this is what made the better one better. Okay, so here we go. Hey, here's a little free advice. People don't like pushy people. I noticed you interrupted Aziz twice in there and then told Stan he must have had a concussion as a boy. Hey, look, I know things got heated, but I think you're out of line and need to apologize. Is everything okay? Okay, so uh, if anybody thinks that the first one was better, um, let me talk to you after class. <laughs> I went a little extreme on that first one. People don't like pushy people. So what I want to know from, from you, Anissa, and whatever's showing up on the chat is what made the worst one worse, and, and perhaps more importantly, what made the better one better? You know, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, uh question and if I practice my new observational skills, uh, the first one um, was super direct, which I prefer to be, um, but it made all kinds of assumptions and just presented it as this is the fact and you need to, to, to behave yourself. Whereas the second one really did end up showing compassion and concern and is everything okay and here's what I observed. Um, and it was just long enough to, to build some kind of rapport is, you know, what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah, and, and there is a lot of, and, and part of it is when we bottle things up, 
we become very angry and then we share them like the first one. Hey, people don't like pushy people. That's not the first time that um, Yolanda's ever seen a coworker um, behave poorly in a meeting. That's, that's the 10th time and they, they're sick of it. But if we don't bottle things up and we, we care about people and our motive is right, and we have some good behaviorally specific things, then, then we get compassion and we get that behaviorally specific feedback. So, hey, you interrupted Aziz twice and then you told Stan he must have had a concussion as a boy. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, because if I just go up and say like, you were an idiot in that meeting, they're gonna say, no, I wasn't, I wasn't an idiot. You know, we, we, it was a heated discussion. I, I was looking out for our team's interests. You know, I don't know what you're talking about. But if you say like, you interrupted Aziz twice and told Stan he must have had a concussion as a boy, I'm like, yeah. I did that. Um, and then she's direct. I think you were out of line and need to apologize, but she's also compassionate. Are you, is everything okay? And, and she's understanding, I, you know, I know things got heated in there, but um, I think you crossed the line and need to apologize. Is everything okay? So when you get behaviorally specific, you can be direct, you can hold people accountable and you can do it from a point of helpful compassion rather than um, frustrated, frustrated annoyance. So Writing that down, helpful compassion. <laughs> helpful compassion is that a frustrated annoyance. Okay, um, I had another one, but I'm going to skip it in the interest of time. It's just another example, but we'll uh, go through it. Okay, so let's wrap up skill number two. Um, start with, I noticed, and end with, I think. This is going to help us effectively pop the top on those tough issues. Um, so all those things that are bottled up, if you can describe it, you can share it. You can pull the top off of it without it being an explosion. You can pop the top off and have it be a pleasant uh, conversation. So um, it all comes down to if you can describe it. Uh, so that is our second skill. Okay, what do we have? Oh, perfect. We have just enough time for our third skill. Let's move on to that one. Skill number three, we're gonna talk about being in selfie mode. Um, the world, is, is we've gone into selfie mode in lots of ways, and um, that certainly has always been the case in communication. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch another video, and as you watch this video, um, I want you to enter your thoughts in the chat box, okay? Just what do you know, what do you think about this video, about how people are behaving? Um, I'll give you a little bit more of a scenario. Yolanda is the team lead this time. We, we not only rotate who gets to be good and bad, but um, what positions they play. So Yolanda is the team lead this time, and she needs input. And um, she's asking good questions. I think Yolanda does a, a fine job here, but um, I want you to evaluate the input she's getting. Okay, just here we go. Okay, as you all know, our budget is much leaner this year. So what I would like is your input on how to spend the funds that we do have in order to update our numbers for next year. Um, I think it's pretty clear that we need to hold off on all discretionary spending. No offense, but that's a little like uh, starting off on a cruise by loading everybody into the lifeboats. Uh, we might as well change our name to Titanic Industries. I've been doing this for 23 years, uh, and, I, and I see plenty of reasons why we should invest. Take my word for it. Lifeboats are there for a reason, Ben. People roll their eyes at me when I talk about fiscal agility, but there are real advantages to it. Okay. Um, Elijah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. My thoughts? I don't know. It'd be nice to upgrade some software, I guess, but then again, Budgets are complicated. It's only complicated if you're blind. You pull back, you get less. You know, you know the saying, it takes money to make money. I appreciate Ben's blind optimism, but in the real world, you can lose big time when you spin the roulette wheel. <laughs> okay, believe it or not, we did not write the script for that video. That was a team. We were asked to come in and work with a team that was having problems. And uh, as near as we can remember it from our notes, that's the exact conversation that took place. So, <laughs> I've, I, I may have been there on that one. I don't know. It feels like it. I've seen this one. That was a meeting we were observing. So um, I want to know what, what comments came in and what thoughts you have about what took place in that meeting. Well, one of the first things that came in was um, I statements and never start off with no offense. 
Um, uh, when I hear no offense, I prepare myself to be offended. <laughs> Um, ben reads is arrogant as he shuts her down and speaks and I know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, Jessica says rough conversation uh, and Ben didn't feel engaged in the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we, we call this selfie mode where everybody in the conversation is just thinking about themselves. Now we think, oh, I never do that. Um, we saw extreme examples of this, but how many times have you been in a conversation and somebody else is talking and you're thinking about your response? Um, it's that idea of being in selfie mode that, that we're not thinking about others. We're not thinking about understanding them. We're not thinking about where they're coming from. We're just thinking about how do I get my point across? Um, it's kind of like a debate. How do I win? Which is what we saw with um, both uh, Tiffany was the first one to talk. She's worried about the money. Ben is the, the older gentleman that, um, that <laughs> thinks we're on the Titanic. Um, but both of them are just interested in convincing. They're not really interested in understanding. Um, and sometimes when we're, in organ when we're in conversations, we see people take that route. They're just trying to win um, and, and they're in selfie mode. Elijah was the last person to speak and a lot of people shut down when that happens. So you get some people that start to battle it out and you get other people that just sort of retreat and say like, I'm, I'm out of here. Um, I'll share my thoughts with somebody after the meeting, but I'm certainly not going to talk in the meeting. That so, was something that uh, one of our listeners actually said. It appears that Elijah doesn't want to give his ideas for fear of Ben being a jerk. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's just not going to play. Um, and that's sad because he might have the most helpful insight. One of the things that um, we did really early in my career is we'd watch group dynamics and the, the places where we, we watched this, there were a lot of people who English was not their first language. It was a tech company. So we had a lot of um, people that were immigrants. They were from India or from different parts of Asia. And we'd, we'd watch these meetings and they would be very heated and they would kind of battle things out and trying to figure out what the right answers were. And the people that would speak the loudest um, would could kind of battle it out. And then everybody else, particularly these people who English was not their first language would totally shut down. And then we'd track it to see who had the answers. In fact, after the meeting, we'd talk to everybody. And we talked to a lot of those people, the immigrants, and, um, and say like, what do you think needs to happen? And um, they would share very articulately and with a lot of technical detail. And we found that more often than not, they had the right answers collectively between them, but it never came out in the meeting because the people that had the greatest technical insight shut down. Um, in that environment. And um, so that, that can happen, right? So there's a lot of negative things going on. So we're going to take a few problems. We're going to marry them together, uh, kind of like a small uh, town. Um, and uh, then we're going to find out one amazing solution that's going to uh, handle all that. So problem number one, most of the time when we're in conversations, we're in selfie mode. We're thinking inside of our head and we're not really listening that well. Problem number two, other people are just trying to win. Um, and when they try to win, they share opinions and conclusions rather than facts and data and those kind of things that are helpful. Problem number three is some people aren't sharing at all. So what's the solution to all three of those problems? It's this motorcycle with this uh, grandma on a wheelchair on a trailer, if you can make that out. Um, so hopefully everybody's got a good visual of that. Yeah. <clears throat> Why is this the answer? I do not have a good reason to strap a grandma, a very old grandma, um, on a wheelchair and strap that wheelchair onto a trailer and pull it behind a motorcycle. I have no reason for that at all. But I promise you, if you could talk to those two on the motorcycle, they would have a great reason for it. I might not agree with it, but they have a reason. So it doesn't matter how bizarre the behavior or how crazy the opinion, people have reasons for what they do and think. Our job is to ask them. Yeah. This is going to do a couple of things. It's going to solve all three of those problems. It's going to make us phenomenal listeners. It gets us out of our head and thinking about our response, and it gets us to really focus on listening. Two, it's going to take people that are only pounding their opinion and their conclusion, and it's going to help us get to what are the facts or what are the reasons behind their opinion and their conclusion. As, as obnoxious as Ben is, Ben has really good value to add to this conversation. He has insights, he has experience, he has facts, he has observations, he's just not sharing it. 
Elijah has it too. So our, our third problem is some people don't want to share at all. If we ask them for their what they think and what their reasons are, we become a better listener. We get people who are pushing their opinions to calm down and share facts and data. And we take people who are afraid to join the conversation. We make it safe for them and we draw their best reasons out as well. Um, it makes all the difference in the world. So let me share what that might look like. So um, this part we did write, this was not based on the meeting, but we thought, what if just one person in that meeting knew this skill of how to, how to ask respectfully, um, openly, encouragingly for people's reasons behind their opinions? What would that look like if somebody had that skill? We think it could have gone something like this. I appreciate Ben's blind optimism, but in the real world, you can lose big time when you spin the roulette wheel. Okay, look, this is a major decision, and we've got some strong opinions here. But what would really help me is to know the reason behind these opinions. Ben, you talked about investing. What would you like to invest in? I think we could pay our sales team better. Give me the top reason why. Well, they've got a lot of experience, and I'd hate to lose them to the competition. When Dwayne left us last year, he said that a limited bonus was a big part of it. And when he left, about a third of his clients went with him. I'm not comfortable with Ben gambling away what little cushion we have in the hopes that people will stay. I mean, when the money's gone, I can't just print more. What are your reasons for worrying about cash flow next year? Well, because it's my job to look ahead, even if no one else cares what's around the corner. Okay, I, I understand. It's a very important part of your job. What are some of the specific problems do you see that might be coming up? We have three products coming off patent this year and I'm worried our sales will drop. I mean, they should come back up when we release new products, but this year will be worse and I'd like a buffer. Three products coming off patent. That's why we need to invest to keep our best sales rep from finding greener pastures. What do you mean by greener pastures? Can you give me a specific example? Sure, Dwayne again. PX5 came off patent, it made it nearly impossible for him to bonus. Okay, I get it, Ben. Elijah, I'd love to hear from you. So what is your best reason for needing upgrades? It would let us do multi-platform tests. I'm sorry, can you translate? Why is that important? Basically, it helps our beta testing go smoother because we're able to simulate a more complex environment. Okay, there we have it. Um, that's what the meeting could have been. If there would have been a little bit of focus on just asking others for their reasons. Yeah. Well, that is our final skill. Skill number three is ask um, for others' reasons. Helps us be better listeners, helps people get beyond opinions and conclusions to facts and observations, draws out people that are a little bit reluctant. So um, all those bottled up kind of issues that we think we can't talk about, we think are so volatile, if we get to the root of the problem, if we can describe it, we can share it by going with what, what did you notice and then what you thought, and then finally ask others for their reasons. Um, so you find out the reasons, the facts, and the observations behind their opinions as well. Three powerful tools that will help you kind of knock the ball out of the park and will help while you're quarantined and cooped up at home, and they'll also help um, with some of the tough conversations that need to happen at work. Not absolutely. Um, you know, one of the uh, things that I'd love for here, love to hear from the folks who have joined us are your takeaways. Um, for me, Neil, the piece around the um, what I notice mm -hmm. and versus what I think is just huge. Um, I've long since developed some language around my perception is dot, 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 is that accurate? However, what I think that I've had a gap on is the behavior um, uh, observation. And so I find for me personally, that's been really valuable. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd like to get your, uh, a quick, uh, ask you a quick question about is you mentioned the piece about the I language. We learn a lot about level one listening where you're just thinking about what's in this for me and, and, and how does this relate to my experience and how can I now fill this void. Um, what is your best advice for someone to develop those other pieces that you've shared around, um, for example, uh, the screen, the slide two slides ago was look for the reasons, mm -hmm. but the skill is about developing questions so that you can draw out the reason. How did you get good at that and how can others? 
Yeah, uh, good question. And and you're right. I, I'm um, you know I'm kind of pulling the the best nuggets for this this uh, hour, so I could pack as much into it as I could. Um, there are in in the 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 more in depth course that we have, there are skills where we go through and we practice and we learn that, and we kind of learn what doesn't work. Um, one of the biggest things that I've learned is it's it's a mental exercise. Is no matter how bizarre what people say, you cannot be judgmental when you ask the question. We find oftentimes that people, the questions they ask when we coach people on this, they're very insincere. They'll say something like, well, given that IT says this isn't possible, how can your idea work? And it's got that pre-qualifier, or you can see just the shock in their face that like you're an idiot, um, but explain, you know, I'm open to, to what makes you an idiot. So I think <laughs> the first thing we need to do is, is completely in our mind, we have to believe that there's a good reason that there really is a good reason for them thinking or doing what they're doing and um, sometimes we can we can I, things that help me with that sometimes I think well what are some of the bizarre things I've done and what were the reasons why I've done them or what have been some of my more um, crazy opinions and why did I have them the thing that I find that helps me the most is to put myself in their shoes and realize I've been the guy with the crazy opinion I've been the guy that did the apparently stupid thing but had a good reason for it and if I think about why I did that and what it was like when I was in that position it helps get my mind right. And when my mind is right, the words tend to come a lot more naturally. Mm. So that's my biggest help with that. Yeah, that's really helpful. That makes a lot of sense. I, that triggered a little bit more of a, uh, another question and we've got just a few minutes left. So if I can, um, if I can indulge us a little bit longer, uh, I am curious about the, where does it fit where you know, in, as a team, we, we can assume we really all want the same thing. We all want success. We all want our organization, especially during this crazy time pandemic, we want um, to be resilient. We want to succeed and we want to be able to navigate this crisis and come out the other side. Where does it fit when you're working with others in, in this dialogue about talking about things that are below the surface when, how do you communicate, Hey, we really are on the same side. We're on the same team here. Yeah. So, um, confession here. Um, this is our one of our most popular topics, and we always do something um, in the full training. We always do something before this. It's a prerequisite. We have so we have all these a la carte kind of workshops that you can do virtually or live. And there's a prerequisite, and you have to do this one first. And everybody rolls their eyes and says, "Really? Do we have to do that one?" The prerequisite is how to get your motive right and to let people know that your motive is right. That is our prerequisite workshop. You have to do that um, before anything else. And people are like, well, can't we just get to the point? Can I just jump straight to the conflict workshop? And it's like, no, you can't. Because if you go into a conflict with tools, but, uh, but your heart's wrong, the tools just become weapons. Um, and the same thing can happen with, with these communication um, tips too. It's what everybody wants. But um, the first thing you have to do is you have to get your motive right and you have to let people know your motive is right. And so um, let me sh share just a few really quick tips because I don't want to say, like, oh, it's in the other workshop. Do the other right. workshop. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so tip number one, um, think collectively. We're all part of a team. If I start thinking, well, that's the guy in that, you know, that's finances issue. No, that's not finances issue. Finance is part of the team. It's our issue because we're a company. So stop thinking of break down the silos and stop thinking that's his issue or that's her problem or that's finances agenda. No, it's our issue. It's our problem. We need to figure this out. So use that collective language and that collective mentality. That's a big help for me. Another help is to think about the kind of person that I want to be. A lot of times, if I think about like, well, what kind of, um, if I'm going to give tough feedback to somebody and I'm just focusing on the problem, I'm more likely to be annoyed and frustrated and my motive is likely to be off. But if I stop and I think like, I'm becoming a kind of person, what kind of a, a, a friend do I want to be? What kind of a coworker do I want to be? What kind of a manager do I want to be? Immediately, I think, well, I want to be the kind of person that's respectful and helpful. And then it gives me a good motive. And as soon as you get a good motive, you can share it. So you can say like, hey, Anissa, I've, I've noticed some things. It's important to me that I'm, I'm a help that, you know, when it comes to coworkers, 
I want to be the kind of person that really cares and that, that, that really steps up. I want to be the friend that tells you you have broccoli in your teeth after lunch. You know what I'm saying? I want to be that guy and I want to do it with, with, with compassion. And then I share the feedback. Or if I say to, to somebody in finance and I've been thinking it's their problem, I say, you know, when you first brought this up, I was kind of annoyed. But the more I thought about it, I thought it's not your issue. It's our issue. We're in this together. And it's got to, if it doesn't work for you guys, it doesn't work for us either. And then I can go into the tough feedback. So, if I focus on everyone and how we're collectively a team, if I focus on the kind of person that I want to be, and also if I give people the benefit of the doubt and assume that they were doing their best and made an honest mistake or that there's some mitigating factor that I don't know about. If I just kind of cut them to some slack and I think I've been the guy that made some mistakes before, I've been the guy that didn't have all the information before, maybe that's the boat they're in now. And I know when I was in that position, I wanted people to cut me some slack. And so I, I try to do the same for them. The important thing is when you do those things, use any of those strategies, it's not just enough to use them yourself. You then have to verbalize them and to create safety for the other person. Well said. So understanding our motive, aligning our motive, because we're going to have a collective motive here when we're on a team. Um, and then making sure you, we verbalize those in a way to encourage a dialogue as opposed to, I've got an agenda that I got to get out. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Wow. Really great, great stuff. I, I know we're, we, we have more that we, so much more that we could cover. I also know that you have created a really great special offer for our folks. Um, do you have that on your screen or you want me to share my screen? Either way, I've got it next. Go right want. ahead. Okay. Uh, tell us about uh, what you've put together for us. Okay. So for um, and, uh, the giveaway, um, two months access to all five of our online workshops. Our online workshops are a little bit different. Um, they're normally $245. You have the one on getting your motive right and sharing your motive. You have one on communicate, uh, which is where I pulled some of this, these nuggets from. There's one on conflict, there's one on motivation, and one on engagement. When you do that, though, you get a lot more. Um, there's some great activities, there's research, there's more videos that you can watch, good and bad examples, and there are certain assignments where I coach you on those. So like we, we have you share some tough feedback and I coach you on how you're sharing that. Or we have you work at resolving the conflict and you kind of say, here's what I'm thinking about saying, and then I, I coach people on that. So it's, it's a high touch, um, high value kind of online workshop. So Exciting. we have that and then a freebie. Um, I put together a little communication planner for the things I covered today and added some tips and tools that we did not have time to, to cover. So it's a two page kind of little worksheet that has little uh, synopses and places to fill things out and little helps and whatnot. And um, that I'm just going to make available to anybody who wants it. Uh, just email me with, um, with communication planner in the subject line and I will send that out to you totally free, no strings attached, just to help you plan out and apply what you've learned today. Love it. Really appreciate it. Let me show my screen too. I want to make sure they have your website. If you'll stop showing yours, I'll show mine. Um, on the freebie, what I want you guys to know, um, sorry, on the giveaway is that our system will randomly select. Um, are you seeing your handsome face there, Neil? Yes, I am. Okay, good. Wanted to make sure I chose the right screen. Um, on the giveaway, our Hey Summit uh, technology will randomly select the two folks who've won and they'll let you know, Neil, as well as you guys on um, the webinar with us that you've, you've won that uh, giveaway. So um, do reach out to Neil if he or his programs can be of service. Um, his website is collaborant.com. I um, also want to share with you guys briefly, um, Turnkey has put together um, some uh, packages that are specific to the time that we're working through right now, one of which is our career transition and employee outplacement services. Um, if Turnkey or Neil or someone on our team can be a support, a sounding board, um, a cheerleader for you, it would be our honor. Um, not just as in, hey, we want to sell you stuff, but we really do know that we're in this together. So um, we look forward to supporting you. Let us also know what other conversations you'd like for us to have on this summit. And Neil, I'm just going to say it out loud. Are you up for another one of these? Because this was fantastic. Sure. We, we can do one of these. So. Good. Nothing like putting you right on the spot. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, I miss training. I, I normally I get to go out and do this, and I, I miss um, I miss this. So this I'd be happy to do another one. Excellent. Excellent. We've got folks that are saying, I enjoyed it. Very informative, really great educational seminar. Uh, and yes, please do another one, Neil. So really appreciate you and bringing your expertise. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you everyone for being here. Please stay safe and healthy.